committee will come to order. At the onset, just a programming note, we, are, we will only, only be conducting opening statements today on the two bills that we'll be marking up tomorrow at 1030. And today, after Mr. Waxman and I offer our opening statements, I understand he is on his way, all members will be afforded the opportunity to offer their statements, and the chair will ask that all members keep their statements to three minutes if they can. And with that, I will recognize myself for five minutes. Colleagues, in recent weeks, this committee has directly responded to the concerns of the American people with respect to two overriding issues, our national debt and the massive and perhaps unconstitutional health care reform legislation passed in the last Congress. On the House floor, we have voted to cut more than $30 billion from future federal spending by eliminating mandatory spending programs in the health care law. But our work there is not finished. Today, however, we begin to replace President Obama's health care bill. We begin with an issue that the overwhelming majority of the American people agree with, health care liability reform. For a decade now, Republicans on this committee have sought common sense, easy to understand reforms to America's completely irrational legal system in this area. The medical liability system in this country is not a system at all. It is a fragmented patchwork of policies that jeopardize access to care and impose added costs to the American people and their government through Medicare and Medicaid. In states without reform, doctors are driven out of certain specialties. Trauma centers have been forced to close and pregnant women have been forced to drive hours to find an obstetrician simply because these practice areas have greater liability risk. States have adopted comprehensive medical liability reform, have witnessed a dramatic turnaround in both access to care as well as liability costs. Texas is a great example. Because Texas adopted comprehensive reform in 03, it now has more obstetricians and emergency physicians and lower medical liability payments. Studies have shown that defensive medicine costs our country as much as $200 billion a year. It also costs patients access to the doctors that they need. It is time to enact real comprehensive reform so that we can finally have a medical liability system that works for our nation's patients and doctors. I was encouraged when President Obama included medical liability reform in this year's State of the Union address. The next day, Republicans on this committee wrote to President Obama promising to work with him on this important issue and asking for his ideas. But now, three months later, we still haven't heard back. So it's time for the committee to act. I've been more than a little amused in recent weeks as legislation has moved through the committee and off the House floor without bipartisan support, excuse me, with bipartisan support that addresses the deficit and the Obama health care law. We have been accused of not having an alternative. Well, I say to my, our friends on both sides of the aisle, be careful what you ask for. Today is just the beginning. Later this month, we'll begin moving legislation to inject competition into the health care system by allowing Americans to shop for insurance across state lines based on the coverage that they need, not the geography of their home. We held a hearing last week on the so-called doc fix, the sustainable growth rate for Medicare, which last year's bill didn't even attempt to deal with. We will, and more is on the way. So I say to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, stay tuned. And let me just say this as it related to uh, medical liability reform and remind my colleagues that Governor Dean, Howard Dean, said, I, and I want to say it was last year, why did they fail to include medical liability reform as part of the president's plan? Here's what he said, and I quote, this is the answer from a doctor and a politician. Here's why tort reform is not in the bill. When you go to pass a really enormous bill like that, the more stuff you put in it, the more enemies you make, right? And the reason that tort reform is not in the bill is because the people who wrote it did not want to take on the trial lawyers in addition to everyone else that they were taking on. And that's the plain and simple truth, end quote. So today we move forward. I'd also like to speak briefly about the other bills scheduled for a vote tomorrow and markup, legislation that protects our nation's chemical facilities from terrorist threats. The Department of Homeland Security has been operating the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards, or CFATS, program since 07. Its mission is to foster coordination between owners and operators of chemical facilities and the department in securing these facilities against the threat of terrorism acts. CFAX has proven to be effective in protecting our nation's chemical facilities from terrorist threats. There is broad agreement in the regulated community and elsewhere that this program is working and that it should be reauthorized with no significant changes. 
It is my view that CFAT should be reauthorized in this committee instead of riding along on an appropriation bill. This committee has been regulating commerce and chemicals for decades, always balancing safety, security, and the economy. We may debate some amendments and work through some differing policy and point of views, but in the end, at the end of the day, I hope that all members will be able to vote to send this bill to the full House for reauthorization. Let's continue to meet our responsibility to this House and to the American people to prevent terrorism, protect jobs, and grow the U.S. economy. I would now recognize uh, the ranking minority member, Mr. Waxman, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we meet today on two bills, H.R. 5, addressing medical malpractice, and H.R. 908, regarding chemical security. And I regret that neither bill reflects our working together on a bipartisan basis. Both are deeply flawed. In our federal system, it is the states that have jurisdiction over insurance, medical licensure, and medical malpractice. But H.R. 5 preempts virtually all of this. That is why the National Conference of State Legislatures has written to express its strong bipartisan opposition to H.R. 5. Not only does H.R. 5 preempt the states, it also fails to tackle the real issues involved in medical malpractice, reducing medical errors, delivering quality care, awarding appropriate and adequate compensation when an injury occurs, and reducing health care costs. H.R. 5 has been before Congress for over a decade. That it has not been enacted into law under Democratic or Republican Congresses and Presidents is itself a verdict on its merits and efficacy. In California, we adopted the Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act, or MICRA, in 1975. Supporters of H.R. 5 claim that their bill is based on that statute. But in fact, H.R. 5 is a significant departure from MICRA. I believe strongly that the problem should be addressed at the state level. Indeed, I cannot understand why the party that claims to champion states' rights on virtually all legislation wants to nullify states' rights on medical malpractice and liability. I particularly object to the inclusion of lawsuits related to FDA-approved drugs and medical devices in this bill. These cases are not part of the problem H.R. 5 supposedly addresses, and they do not belong in any bill on, quote, medical malpractice reform, end quote. I will offer an amendment to fix this major flaw. I also object to the caps in H.R. 5. 250000 is inadequate compensation for people who are going to live the rest of their lives disfigured and in pain. It is hardly a deterrent for the large companies and organizations H.R. 5 would shield from liability. The $250,000 figure is the one that we have in California. It was adopted in 1975 and has not been increased ever since. H.R. 5 forces us to choose between the current state of medical malpractice and policies which overturn centuries of state authority. That's a false choice. Instead, we should find evidence-based solutions which address physician concerns, improve care, reduce costs, and reinforce state leadership. That is what we did in the Affordable Care Act, which authorized $50 million in grants to the states to develop alternatives to current tort litigation systems. Let's experiment and learn, not dictate and close our eyes to injury and injustice. With respect to H.R. 908, I had hoped that this would be an area where our committee could come together on a bipartisan solution. But despite our re repeated overtures, we have not been able to take common sense steps to ensure the nation's chemical facilities are not vulnerable to terrorist attacks. In 2006, Congress gave the Department of Homeland Security the authority to create the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standard Program, or CFATS. It was done through a provision attached to an appropriations bill and, and was intended as a temporary fix until Congress could establish a comprehensive program. The CFATS program is a good start, and the Department of Homeland Security deserves credit for attempting to make an inadequate law work. But the program leaves too many chemical-laden facilities 
vulnerable to terrorism. CFAS does not cover a range of facilities that could endanger thousands in the event of a worst case chemical release, including chemical plants located on ports and federal facilities. It also doesn't apply to drinking water facilities, which are often in populated areas and contain large amounts of highly toxic chemicals. It allows chemical facilities to be exempted simply because one part of the plant is subject to regulation by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. These are security gaps that we need to close. CFATS also doesn't include key protections for workers who are on the front lines of preventing and responding to a potential terrorist attack. Our efforts to reach consensus have not succeeded. The rationale appears to be that if we don't do as the oil companies request, the Republican leadership will strip our committee of jurisdiction to address this serious problem. The logic is that in order to preserve jurisdiction, we must not exercise it. This is an abdication of our responsibility to the American people. Our job is not to please the oil companies, but to pass legislation that protects American families. In its current form, uh, this bill does not do this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Back my time. Would recognize the Chairman Emeritus of the Committee, Mr. Barton, for three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Upton, for conven convening the markup on H.R. 5 and H.R. 908. As you know, H.R. 5 is to uh, fix our medical liability system. Current system uh, is broken and needs to be fixed. High jury awards and the cost of defending against lawsuits, some of them frivolous, result in high medical liability premiums with the most devastating results for patients with regards to access to care. The proven reforms contained in the Health Act would help reduce cost while ensuring that patients who have been injured due to negligence receive fair compensation. The key to success is balance. This bill, <coughs> in my opinion, provides the right balance by promoting expedient resolutions to disputes, maintaining access of all for all to the courts, maximizing patient recovery of damage awards with unlimited uh, compensation for economic damages and limiting non-economic damages to $250,000. The bill before us would also provide a sliding scale cap on attorney fees, collateral source rule reform with a ban on subrogation, periodic payment of future damages, and a three year from incident or one year from discovery statute of limitations. This is a good bill, and I hope that the committee will move it expeditiously. With regards to H.R. 908, we have been in a bipartisan agreement on the implementation and continuation of the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards Act as well, for the most part. When something works, it works, Mr. Chairman. It's important to step back and acknowledge that some truly good progress has been made. There's been much give and take between the chemical industry and the Department of Homeland Security and this Congress with regards to process and implementation. It's important that we keep it simple, continue the program, extend the sunset date, allow for the appropriate appropriations to fund the program, and provide a stable environment for the industry to move forward with upgraded security measures. This is a good bill, and I hope we move it expeditiously also. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I would recognize the uh, ranking member of the Health Subcommittee, Mr. Pallone, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to begin by expressing my great disappointment that you've chosen to move legislation through the House Energy and Commerce Full Committee without following regular order. Specifically today, we're marking up H.R. 5, a controversial, historically partisan bill that transforms the medical malpractice system without consideration by the Health Subcommittee. While the Health Subcommittee was able to weigh in during its hearing, it's important that members are given the opportunity to amend that bill at both the subcommittee and the full committee level. I strongly believe that the subcommittee process should play a critical role in the committee's effort to make its best recommendations on a measure to the full House, and it's my hope that skipping regular order does not become common practice while we move forward. Now, let me mention my opposition to both bills before us today. The first, H.R. 5, is much too controversial and extreme in its current form. 
In fact, although it's described as a medical malpractice measure, H.R. 5 extends far beyond the field of medical liability, malpractice liability, extending new tort protections to nursing homes, pharmaceuticals, device, and insurance companies and others. It should be limited to medical malpractice. I do understand that medical malpractice and liability is a very real problem for doctors in my home state and the country, but H.R. 5 is not the answer. Any true reform must take a balanced approach and include a mechanism to control the actual increase in insurance premiums. I don't believe that tort reform alone will accomplish that goal. And finally, we can't continue to consider a low and arbitrary cap on non-economic damages. A cap of 250000 is an unrealistic number, and that's why I'll offer an amendment to raise the cap. Now, in terms of H.R. 908, I'd like to express my opposition. It only extends the current Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism, or CFATS, program, but does not sufficiently protect the more than 100 million Americans that live in the danger zone of a chemical disaster. In New Jersey, we have the unfortunate combination of both a large number of chemical facilities and a high population density, so the consequences of insufficient security are dire. The current interim statute enacted as a rider to the 2007 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill temporarily authorized CFAS to give Congress time to enact comprehensive legislation. In the 111th Congress, the House passed H.R. 2868, and that bill provided a comprehensive security program to protect Americans living near these facilities, but unfortunately, the Senate did not take it up. What else is new? I feel that Republicans are ignoring important and necessary policy changes by simply passing an extension of current law. We must focus on solutions that will close dangerous gaps in security, and I urge my colleagues to vote against both measures before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm uh, pleased to support the energy and commerce markup today, and I think the fact that 28 states already have in place uh, caps and their own uh, innovative ways to hold down um, flagrant uh, lawsuits uh, shows that the bill really represents the majority of this country's population in wanting to have uh, timely health care costs without uh, legal ramifications. So I support uh, H.R. 908 and the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorist Standards or CFATS Act. Uh, this health care bill is a very important, and the fact that it perhaps wasn't marked up in subcommittee doesn't mean that it doesn't have broad support across this country. I think everybody in this room and in this uh, Congress believes that medical liability has raised the cost of health care in our country by simply forcing doctors to practice defensive medicine. This hurts the doctors. Patient relationship as physicians view every patient as a potential litigant. So an analysis, in fact, by the Congressional Budget Office confirms this. They said that the comprehensive medical liability reform, which is in this bill, H.R. 5, we reduce the deficit by $62 billion over 10 years. That's a huge amount of money. And that's savings to the government. And that does not even include the savings to the private sector. Now, an important aspect about this, the ranking member, Mr. Waxman, uh, is against the bill. But in his state, from 1975, they have had caps on non-economic damage. Uh, I don't even think he supports his own state's cap. Uh, and this bill has caps on punitive damage, but it does not have caps on unlimited economic damage. So it's trying to reach a compromise. So I'm surprised that the ranking member would be vociferously against this bill. So many states, have, as I mentioned, have already done medical liability reform, have set limits, and will continue to be able to operate under these limits because, frankly, we don't upset those states. We let states like California to continue to operate. Uh, those states that have limits greater or less than the federal standard. And I'll just briefly mention, Mr. Chairman, the second piece of legislation we're considering, H.R. 908. This would extend the Department of Homeland Security authority to implement the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorist Standards Program, CFATS, through September 30th, uh, 2017. Uh, if this bill, uh, when enacted, uh, will allow time for full implementation and evaluation of CFATS before any changes to this important programs are considered. My colleagues, the need for annual reauthorization of the program has created uncertainty for facilities regulated by CFATS. Without the assurance of long-term authorization of these regulations, companies can run the risk of investing in costly activities today that might not satisfy regulatory standards tomorrow. So, Mr. Chairman, I encourage my colleagues to support both of these bills, and I think uh, 
Uh, I, I also compliment the uh, subcommittee chairman, Mr. Pitt, for bringing this forward. Thank you. Chair, thanks to the gentleman and recognizes the ranking member emeritus, Mr. Dingell, for three minutes. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy, and I am grateful for this uh, opportunity to be heard. Uh, today's markup feels a little like deja vu all over again. The House has considered H.R. 5 or substantially identical versions of that legislation on four other occasions, the 109th, 108th, 107th. Congress's this legislation passed the House, but it was never taken up by the Senate. I don't often have kind words for my friends in the Senate, but I happen to note that they've had the wisdom not to take this bill up. I am sure that all of my colleagues here in this committee would agree that the medical malpractice system should be the part of a broader discussion of our health care system, and that, it ought, and that we ought to consider in its broadest forms what really needs to be done. But I would ask my colleagues, why are we continuing to waste time on a piece of legislation that has no future? I believe that we need medical malpractice reform. But H.R. 5 is a flawed attempt at medical malpractice reform. It provides special protections to drug and medical device companies. It broadly preempts state laws designed to protect consumers and patients. It limits the time period under which injured patients can file a claim in an unfair way. And it caps non-economic damages at $250,000. If my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are serious about wanting to reform medical malpractice liability, then we need to find a third way in which we can resolve the question. Such a discussion is badly needed, and I will be here waiting my colleagues to engage with me in a serious discussion on what we really ought to do with an honest expectation of accomplishing something. When we worked on health insurance reform in the last Congress, I advocated for the inclusion of a medical malpractice reform in the legislation. We did take small steps forward on that matter. The Affordable Care Act authorized $50 million for grants to the states to develop and implement alternatives to the current tort litigation system. And currently, the states and academia are working with the Department of Health and Human Services Patient Safety and Medical Liability Initiative to research and test models for patient safety and medical liability reform. If my colleagues are serious about addressing medical malpractice reform, then here I sit. I'm ready to work with anybody who really wants to do something. In the meantime, my colleagues should not decide to go it alone. I would urge my colleagues to vote against H.R. 5's attempt at reform because it is unfortunately flawed. Instead, I think we should move forward on a bipartisan manner towards a careful, balanced, and targeted legislation that will serve both the interests of patients and physicians, not medical malpractice insurance companies. I thank you for your kindness in recognizing me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Chair would recognize Mr. Pitts for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to support both bills in the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee markup today. The September 2010 issue of Health Affairs included an article titled National Cost of the Medical Liability System, which estimated that medical liability costs, including defensive medicine, were $55.6 billion in the year 2008, or 2.4% of the total health care spending. To protect themselves from lawsuits, many doctors practice what is known as defensive medicine. This is when doctors order additional or redundant tests and services to ensure they can defend themselves in court should they be sued. A recent study of Pennsylvania orthopedic surgeons conducted by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia found that nearly one-fifth of medical images ordered were done for defensive purposes. And it's not just tests that are done for defensive purposes. A Massachusetts Medical Society study found that 13% of hospitalizations were done for defensive pur purposes. Not only does defensive medicine add cost to the system at large, but unnecessary tests and hospitalizations jeopardize patient health. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, my home state of Pennsylvania ranks second behind New York in the total dollars paid out in malpractice claims at $295,459,500. And the average claims payment in Pennsylvania was higher 
than the national average. Pennsylvania has also paid more malpractice claims than any state except New York, California, and Florida with 767 paid claims in 2009. According to the Pennsylvania Department of Health, nearly 20 percent of the physicians who practice primary care say they will leave Pennsylvania in five years or less, and only one in three physicians who complete their medical degree in Pennsylvania plan to remain in the state to practice. My home state consistently ranks as having one of the worst medical liability climates in the nation. The high legal costs paid by Pennsylvania health care providers increase overall health care costs, limit access to medical care, and inhibit job growth. The current medical liability system is not working for anyone, least of all patients who need access to quality care. So what can we do to protect those patients who have been injured by medical mistakes or, and rightly deserve com compensation and yet still make states like Pennsylvania affordable for providers to practice in? and also dramatically reduce the practice of defensive medicine? We don't need more demonstration projects like the kind in PPACA. We've already had two very successful demonstration projects, California and Texas. H.R. 5 mirrors California's 1975 Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act, which has held the state's medical liability insurance premiums to an increase of only 261 percent from 1976 to 2009. That might not sound impressive, but during that same period, the medical liability insurance premiums in the other 49 states increased by 945 percent. H.R. 5 allows plaintiffs to recover the full amount of their economic loss and caps non-economic damages at $250,000. Punitive damages would be limited to two times the amount of economic damages awarded or $250,000, whichever is greater. It would also limit attorneys contingency fees so that awards go to injured plaintiffs, not trial attorneys looking for the next multi-million dollar payout. We need a medical liability system that punishes bad doctors and provides for hurt patients, not one that punishes every doctor and every patient. H.R. 5 is a balanced, thoughtful approach to this problem, and I commend my friend Dr. Gingry for introducing the bill yet again this Congress, and I urge support for H.R. 5 and yield back. Kellen's time has expired. The chair would recognize Mr. Towns for an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for convening today. Uh, for implementation of the Chemical Facility and Terrorism Standard Act, regrettably, I must oppose both of these measures in their current forms. But I will focus my remarks and time on my views of H.R. 5. Notably, this bill seeks to reform the medical malpractice system, among other things, setting a $250,000 cap on non-economic damages. Mr. Chairman, I believe that medical malpractice reform is most suitably left to the states and not the federal government. As it always has been only states can adequately determine what methods may best reduce malpractice premiums for their constituents. By imposing a monetary cap at the federal level is not the way to go about it. Congress is picking one maximum amount that is meant to be sufficient to address every single instance of malpractice across the nation regardless of the facts of the case, and most importantly, regardless of what part of the country it occurs in. $250,000 is simply not the same amount in New York City as it is in many other states around the nation. Picking one number does not account for the variation in cost of living. It does not account for differences in rent or food or Band-Aids or medical supplies or medical services. One number simply cannot do that. One size does not fit all. Thankfully, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act provided a small investment of $50 million to states to test different methods of medical malpractice reform. After these pilots are completed, states are to report 
on their successes and their failures so that other states can learn from and adopt successful practices. We would be wise to hold off until the results of these pilots have concluded so that we can allow states the opportunity to implement programs that may in fact be successful in reducing malpractice premiums. Thank you again for convening this markup, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to our discussions tomorrow as we thoroughly examine these bills and recognizing that one side does not fit all. On that note, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair would recognize Mr. Walden from Oregon for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a unique opportunity today to come one step closer to achieving true health reform by finally addressing our nation's broken medical liability system. And I join our physicians in Oregon and across the country in thanking you, Mr. Chairman, and Dr. Gingrey and others on the committee for bringing H.R. 5, the Health Act, before our committee. In rural areas like Oregon's nearly 70,000 square mile second district, the need to practice defensive medicine is further exasperated by the current workforce shortage. Coincidentally, the types of providers most difficult to find in rural and un underserved areas, such as obstetricians and specialists, are also most commonly susceptible to malpractice claims. So I believe every good acting physician would agree that each patient should be entitled to fair and just recourse, but I am just as confident those same good acting physicians have a desire and interest in upholding the integrity of their profession by acting in their parents' be or their patients' best interests. In fact, a physician swears by an oath to do just that. It's important to note that this bill would not eliminate a patient's ability to seek legal retribution by allowing an unlimited amount of economic damages, but implementing a cap on punitive damages, it protects patients' rights while also ensuring providers' ability to practice good medicine, lower medical malpractice premiums, and increase overall access to care. As the Health Subcommittee heard during this bill's hearing, certain physician groups opposed the Affordable Care Act's final passage simply because it did not meaningfully address medical liability reform. And in that hearing, Dr. Hollier, a Texas OBGYN, said, and I quote, we simply cannot build a reformed health system on top of a broken medical liability system, close quote. And we have, in fact, seen direct proof that states that have adopted comprehensive medical liability reform, like Texas and California, have seen remarkable improvements in access to OBGYNs, particularly in rural areas. Dr. Hollier is absolutely correct, Mr. Chairman. Any reform in our health system must first fix our current broken medical liability system, and I therefore support this important piece of legislation and yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Chairman or would recognize a gentleman from Texas for three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding a markup on H.R. 903 to reauthorize the CFATS program. This legislation is vitally important to the district I represent, which has the largest concentration of chemical producing facilities in the U.S. Most of the workers in these plants live in our district, and I strongly support ensuring the safety of our plants from terrorist attacks, but also support the safety of our workers and my constituents. Due to the impact of this legislation on our district, I've been very involved in H.R. 908 and been in contact with Chairman Shifkus over the last few weeks trying to come to an agreement on several provisions. We were able to come to an agreement on continuity of background checks, which is an issue of vital importance not only to the workers but the industry. This provision will bring clarity to the CPATS program and ensure workers who are employees of a company that own land and waterside facilities would be able to go between the plants without additional background checks. I, I have to say I'm disappointed that the jurisdictional issues we have with Homeland Security Committee has taken precedent over more moderate authorization length. And I want to maintain energy and commerce jurisdiction of CFATS, but I have reservations about authorizing this program for eight years instead of seven or five. And to that point, I'll be uh, offering uh, an amendment to include, uh, to reduce it to five years. I also intend to offer an amendment to include workers the development of site security plans. Workers have unmatched knowledge of the facilities in which they work. They also have, are the last line of defense and the first affected by an attack. It makes sense to include them in development of site security plans. These amendments pertain to issues that were important to me during the debate last year under H.R. 2868, which I supported when it was passed out of, the, out of this House. H.R. 2868 uh, was not perfect, included substantial compromises, permanently extending chemical and water security regulations 
while reducing duplicative regulatory standards, increasing worker protections, and providing important safeguards to chemical facilities and water systems. If H.R. 2868 were before the committee today, I'd support it. While I do not agree with everything we had in it, it was far a superior piece of legislation. Houston Chronicle reported today, or had an editorial today, on inter inherently safer technology in H.R. 908. And I agree companies should do all they can to reduce their risk. It makes sense for them to do so with a safety and business protective perspective. However, I recognize the current political reality and some provisions of that bill, namely inherently safer technology, are not acceptable to the new uh, majority. So here today with an extension on the current law with a couple of compromises. The bill is not perfect, but I believe we need some surety in the program to continue to be funded. A year-to-year -year authorization will be held by a political uh, budget debate does not offer safety assurances or, or to the industry or their employees, and their investments in safety are a wise investment. Overall, the safety of these facilities far outweighs any political debate we have here in Washington. While I'm not ha entirely happy with H.R. 908, it offers continuity to the system and a step forward on the issues of concern to me, most notably the background checks. Mr. Chairman, I also want to uh, ask unanimous to put the remainder of my statement and record in my opposition, H.R. 5. Uh, I think it would hurt what we already have in Texas to have a federalization of malpractice uh, laws, and that's why I oppose it and yield back my time. I would recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And no doubt uh, that there are additional costs in this system. There's overutilization. And finding the right policies to deal with that, uh, wringing out the overutilization and the additional expenses not necessarily related to the quality of the health care itself, is necessary and most states have tried to do that by reforming their tort laws and medical malpractice reform. In fact, only a handful of states have yet to uh, implement some sort of medical malpractice to reform to do that. Tort law is an area of law traditionally left completely to the state's discretion. Again, most states have already adopted some sort of medical liability protections within their states. If you're a true believer in the Tenth Amendment, then why are we not allowing the states to continue to create their own laws and decide what is in their best interest for their residents? It's not the federal government's role to say that one state's laws are better than another's or even mandate one state's belief on another. I for example, the Texas or California model now has to be imposed on the other 48 states. If you consider yourself to be a true states' rights person, then why do we give the states the latitude and ability to do all of it and take it away with the one-size-fits-all mandate from the federal government? Uh, I have heard or been briefed that Section 11 of H.R. 5 does protect the state's rights, but if you read it, it is extremely restrictive, and most states that have medical liability or medical malpractice liability reform laws will have this federal law supersede it. Read Section 11. It is a one-size-fits-all. It seems ironic to me that as someone who passionately opposed the nationalization of our health care based on the fact that this was extreme federalism and usurped states' rights, that now because it's politically expedient for us on this side of the aisle, that we are now engaging in that same philosophical conduct. And I look forward to offering amendments uh, tomorrow to show how we are usurping states' rights. I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois for three minutes, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While I oppose both bills that are before us this afternoon, I'd like to focus my remarks on H.R. 5. We do have a medical malpractice crisis in this country. But it is not that injured consumers are suing too much. In fact, the number of suits has declined. 
It is not that injured consumers are receiving exorbitant compensation. In fact, the size of settlements and awards has been stable, tracking the rate of medical inflation. The crisis we are facing in America is that too many patients are the victims of medical errors and too many good doctors are being overcharged by private insurers. We haven't heard from medical malpractice victims, but they are the ones who should be front and center. We can't make this a fight between doctors and trial lawyers and lose sight of the fact that too many Americans will be affected by malpractice. Their lives and the lives of their families will never be the same. It is their interest that we must protect. According to Health Affairs, one in three patients admitted to a hospital experiences an adverse event. They get the wrong prescription, the wrong surgical procedure, acquire an infection. But this goes far beyond preventable, preventable medical injuries in hospitals. This legislation so broadly drafted is so broadly drafted that it will apply to medical devices, pharmaceutical products, nursing homes, and for-profit health insurers. We haven't any assurances that this bill will reduce the incidence of medical malpractice, nor has anyone given us any assurance that it will lower medical liability premiums. But one thing is certain. It will trample on states' rights and take away longstanding civil justice rights. Taking away patients' rights does not improve the quality of our health care system. It just leaves injured consumers without recourse. I especially oppose arbitrary caps on non-economic damages and other restrictions on the rights of medical malpractice victims to seek accountability and compensation for their injuries. We um, are hearing from the proponents of H.R. 5 that these caps are not harmful because economic costs, medical bills, and lost wages are left uncapped. But what about injuries that are just as painful but less quantifiable? The inability to bear children, the loss of a spouse or child or grandparent, excruciating pain, permanent and severe disfigurement. Non-economic damages compensate injured victims for very real injuries, and those who suffer those injuries deserve their full and fair day in court. H.R. 5 is an attack on victims who for the rest of their lives will suffer as a result of negligence and malpractice. We should not add to their pain by denying them their legal rights. And finally, let me say, I would have a lot more trust in um, a, a, a panel of my peers to decide my particular individual case than I do on lawmakers who are far from being doctors to set an arbitrary cap. And I yield back. Uh, the chair recognizes for three minutes opening statement, the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess. And I thank the gentleman for yielding or for rec the recognition. Um, I certainly look forward to the markup of H.R. 5 tomorrow. In fact, while both bills are important, let me just confine my remarks to H.R. 5. For 25 years in North Texas, I served as a doctor, delivered over 3,000 babies, and handled my share of high-risk births. Because of the nature of my profession, I wasn't immune to being named in a non-meritorious lawsuit. Although those claims were unfounded and eventually dropped, my patients lost something in that transaction, certainly the benefit of my time and care lost because I was away from my practice, defending my livelihood, defending my name. The current legal environment reduced my patients' access, and that really is what this should be about. Now, stop the presses. I do agree with President Obama. In one of his statements in the State of the Union address, he said, medical malpractice reform is needed. Mr. President, I agree. In fact, I sent the President a letter immediately after that State of the Union address, and I'm still waiting to hear his response. If the President is reluctant to act, if the President is reluctant to lead on this issue, this committee is only too happy to help. Now, I've often spoken about the successful reforms we've had in Texas. Liability reforms have served as a catalyst to bring doctors to underserved regions, including those that had no access to physicians in the past. Texas is one of the largest and divert, most diverse states in our union. And in fact, I would remind my colleagues that 135 years ago this spring, Texas was its own country. Yet, our reforms have proven successful and they have produced results across the board. Today, the State Medical Board of Texas is challenged to keep up with the applications of physicians moving to our state from New Jersey and Pennsylvania who want to practice in Texas. These doctors share a similar story as, as I do with millions of patients that know what works. 
the legal environment in which doctors practice is lopsided to favor a very narrow special interest group, those of trial lawyers. They prey on vulnerable patients and doctors, rarely in the pursuit of justice, but in the pursuit of material gain. In a country that has the highest quality of care in the world, it should never be easier to sue a doctor than it is to see a doctor. And in Texas, in particular, we have counties that now have OB-GYNs, ER doctors, counties that had not had this type of physician in practice for a long, long time. In this country, we also have national medical insurance. It's called Medicare, it's called Medicaid, it's called SCHIP. It begs for a national solution. But the bottom line is patients and doctors all across the country do need relief. Today, we put pa patients first. The House will act. The Senate will have to make their choice, and they'll have to live with their choice. Do they stand with patients or doctors, or do they stand with the president and narrow special interest groups? I yield back the balance of my time. The chair recognizes for a three-minute opening statement the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Today we are discussing two bills, one to extend a weak and insufficient program, and another, H.R. 5, which would stifle state innovation and re-victimize those who have been harmed. We know medical malpractice is a serious problem. That's why health care reform included grants to states to develop innovative medical malpractice reforms. H.R. 5, on the other hand, simply imposes a one-size-fits-all approach, circumventing states' autonomy and innovation. It does nothing to achieve the important goals of protecting patients and medical professionals and reducing health care costs. Instead, this bill simply limits the amount of money that those who were wrongfully harmed, the patients, can be justly awarded to compensate them for their injuries. <clears throat> this shifts the cost from the party at fault onto injured individuals, their families, and taxpayers. And it does nothing to reduce the astounding number of costly <clears throat> and preventable medical errors that claim nearly 100,000 lives each year. Study after study has shown that when doctors and hospitals focus on improving patient care reducing <clears throat> and reducing medical errors, not only are patients' lives saved, but costs go down too. These studies, many of which we heard about at our subcommittee hearing, are instructive in how to reduce the actual, not the hypothetical, cost of malpractice. It, all, it is also important to note that this bill goes way beyond protecting doctors and patients. In fact, I'm deeply concerned that H.R. 5 protects drug companies and HMOs from lawsuits in many cases in which they have clearly hurt people. Lastly, I find it ironic that the, this majority, who for so long has championed state and local control, are supporting a bill that would impose a mandate from Washington with no flexibility in an area that has so traditionally been state law. And I must point out additional hypocrisy of the majority which cried out endlessly about the need to stick to regular order during health care reform has yet skip, simply skipped the subcommittee process on this bill. I am also concerned with the second bill our committee will consider today, H.R. 908. Across the United States, thousands of industrial facilities still use and store hazardous chemicals in quantities that put large numbers of Americans at risk for serious injury or death. Despite industry claims, federal studies confirm that security at chemical facilities ranges from poor to non-existent. Unfortunately, this legislation fails to require any disaster prevention at the highest risk chemical plants and exempts hundreds of hazardous refineries and water treatment plants. Mr. Chairman, it's time to pass permanent chemical security regulations, and it's time that manufacturers move toward new, safer technologies and chemicals. Unfortunately, the bill before us today fails to protect communities from chemical terrorism. I urge my colleagues not to extend this current inadequate program or the, to create another one through H.R. 5. I yield back my time. The chair recognizes a gentlewoman from uh, Tennessee for three minutes opening statement, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Every physician and health care professional will tell you that in order to truly reform the nation's health care system, we must focus on cost reduction, improved quality, and increased access for all Americans. 
They will also tell you that true medical liability reform is a key component, a necessary component of this reform, and it is necessary to address it so that we do continue to ensure access to care. It was unfortunate that such reform was not a component of the broader health care bill that was debated last Congress and what we all know and call Obamacare. That was a lost opportunity. Many of our states have taken the lead on this issue because they know that the lack of liability reform hurts patients and it impacts the patient's ability to receive care due to the enormous added cost incurred in the practice of defensive medicine, which has driven trial lawyers looking for easy cash to come on in and file a lawsuit on what they de deem to be bad outcomes or adverse events. Any attempt to make health care available to the underserved and uninsured will be doomed to failure if the legal costs of practicing medicine are not addressed. With reimbursement issues added to the high cost of liability insurance, physicians, who are many times small business owners, must weigh the risk of taking new patients, particularly the uninsured, if the cost of care exceeds the cost of reimbursement. A physician in my district recently told me this. He said, without significant and real tort reform, no plan, no plan to control increasing health care costs will ever succeed. I agree with him. I think it's appropriate that we are bringing forward H.R. 5. It begins our debate to address these issues. It is a key issue in deciding how we're going to increase costs, increase access, and lower cost. And I look forward to moving the bill through committee. Yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, for three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sometimes we lose sight of some simple facts. Um, these caps, these reductions, these limitations, do you know when they apply? They apply after a finder of fact in a meritorious lawsuit has found that a health care provider is guilty of negligence and that the negligence was the proximate cause of an injury to the patient. Only then. First, you prove negligence. What we're talking about here are lawsuits in which negligence is proven. And we forget about that. We just think this is going to apply across the board and, and things are just going to happen naturally and, and, and doctors that are not guilty of negligence will benefit somehow as a result of this law. That's not true. The victim is victimized again. That's what's happening. And I know we refer to the Texas experiment as some sort of miracle and I, can, and I think there are aspects of it that you could point to. But I do know this. It has not reduced health care costs in Texas. Texas law didn't do that because uh, costs have grown twice the national average since 2003. The Texas law does not reduce mal malpractice premiums for certain specialties, such as internists, which is 27% higher. Uh, it does not reduce the cost of health care insurance for consumers. Since 2003, premiums for individuals increased by 114%, and for families, 144%. And is it does not improve access to care contrary to what everyone is telling you when you really look at Texas ranking 43 out of 50 states in physicians per capita. What does this bill actually do? I think it protects those individuals that are truly negligent and do not meet the standard of care that is required and expected by anyone. But why should health care providers be subjected to meaningful liability for their acts of negligence and even intentional torts in this law? And I'll tell you why. Because without liability, there is no accountability. Without accountability, there is no responsibility. This will create a special class, immune from the consequences of their mistakes. I truly believe that good doctors and health care professionals don't want to protect colleagues that don't practice medicine competently or professionally, which is the true impact of H.R. 5. Thank you very much, uh, very much Mr. Chairman, and I will yield back. Uh, the chairman now recognizes himself.
uh, Dr. Gingrey for an opening statement for three minutes or four minutes or five minutes. Uh, I want to uh, first of all thank uh, uh, Chairman Upton, uh, Subcommittee Chairman uh, Pitts uh, for calling today's markup. You know, I, along with Judiciary Committee Chairman Lamar Smith and my colleague from Georgia, Democratic member David Scott, are the proud authors of H.R. 5, the Health Act. Put simply, this country is on the verge of a medical liability crisis. We have unfortunately facilitated a culture, uh, and Dr. Burgess said this earlier, where it is much easier to sue your doctor than it is to see your doctor. That might sound trite, but it's a fact. Although this has become a reality all, for all physicians, it has disproportionately impacted my specialty of nearly 30 years, OBGYN. Uh, the current truth that OBGYNs face is that each of them will, on average, be sued three times during the course of their careers. And while over 50 percent of these cases are eventually dropped, dismissed, or settled without payment, 30 percent of ACOG fellows report increasing cesarean deliveries over traditional birth, and 26 percent have stopped performing or offering traditional births, although uh, altogether due to the fear of facing a, a lawsuit. These statistics represent one of the largest cost drivers in healthcare today, known as defensive medicine. The ordering of tests or procedures in order to shield the medical provider from a lawsuit. This fear of litigation, according to a 2010 Mount Sinai School of Medicine study, has led 91 percent of physicians across all specialties to practice this thing known as defensive medicine. Additionally, according to a 2008 Price Waterhouse Coopers study, defensive medicine costs $210 billion annually. H.R. 5 will help us accomplish the important goal of lowering health care costs. The nonpartisan CBO, Congressional Budget Office, has already scored this legislation, and I think very conservatively, as saving the federal government $62 billion over the next 10 years. The benefits of H.R. 5 are not just economic. A study conduct conducted by the Journal of the American Medical Association found that meaningful medical liability reform will help increase the overall supply of physicians at a time when the current state of health care is threatening to drive many physicians, particularly those in these high-risk specialties, out of practice. According to the Center for Delivery, Organization, and Markets Research, counties and states with reform had 2.2 percent more physicians, and rural counties had 3.2 percent more physicians per capita than similar areas without reform. Furthermore, H.R. 5 would ensure full economic and medical compensation for patients while advancing the idea that patients should receive their fair share of awards. This leg legislation will mitigate the threat posed by those who are currently seeking to make a profit from the injuries of patients, such as hedge funds, hard money investors, and yes, some unscrupulous ambulance chasers. H.R. 5 represents a kind of reform that is gaining bipartisan support. Even President Obama acknowledged this during his State of the Union address when he stated, still, I'm willing to look at other ideas to bring down health care costs, including one that Republicans suggested last year, medical malpractice reform to rein in frivolous lawsuits. There is too much money being wasted on frivolous lawsuits and the practice of defensive medicine. In order to put a stop to this practice and turn our focus back to patients, I ask all my colleagues to support H.R. 5, and I apologize for going over my time. Uh, I will now recognize uh, the gentlewoman from Wisconsin for three minutes for her opening statement, uh, Congresswoman Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will confine my opening remarks to H.R. 5 and spend a little time talking about the situation in my state. Uh, since the 1970s, Wisconsin has maintained a medical malpractice policy that has produced successful outcomes for both doctors and patients. With flexibility to think creatively, Wisconsin established a system in which health professionals are guaranteed access to affordable medical liability coverage. 
and injured patients and their families are guaranteed to receive reasonable monetary relief for injuries. Wisconsin law requires physicians, hospitals, and other health care professionals to have medical liability insurance. This private health insurance pays claims of up to $1 million for each claim arising from an occurrence in a year, or up to $3 million for all claims arising from all occurrences in a year. For medical malpractice claims that exceed the limits of this primary medical liability insurance coverage, all physicians have access to the Injured Patients and Families Compensation Fund. Physicians contribute to this fund on an annual basis. Notably, this fund typically makes more money in interest than it pays to injured patients. Let me just repeat that. This fund typically makes more money in interest per year than it pays to injured patients. As of June 30th, 2010, the fund had assets of $855.1 million. And Mr. Chairman, Wisconsin's medical malpractice laws have produced successful outcomes. Medical liability insurance premiums paid by Wisconsin doctors have been nearly the lowest in the nation. And the number of medical negligence cases has decreased significantly since the laws were enacted. The number of people per year who have been compensated for injuries or death caused by physician negligence have been nearly the lowest per capita in the nation and Wisconsin medical malpractice insurers have the lowest loss ratio of all states' medical malpractice insurers. But it's important to note that Wisconsin's medical uh, malpractice laws are a solution that works for Wisconsin. It may not work in Texas, Michigan, or Pennsylvania, but the system seems to be working in Wisconsin. So I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill and allow states like Wisconsin to continue to have the authority to establish laws that best meet each state's need. With my limited time left, I just want to note that you know, the, the clerk of the House sets aside the first 10 bills of the year for the signature bills of the majority party, 1 through 10. So far, this committee has deliberated over H.R. 3, that takes away women's rights, H.R. 5, that's taking away states' rights, these are the things the new majority wants to be known for. And I'd just like to point out that last fall, they were running on jobs. When are we going to see bills come through this committee that are focused on jobs and our economy? The chair recognizes for three-minute opening statement the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The United States has been the world's biggest manufacturing nation for over a century, but this year, in 2011, we lost that esteem to China. The chemical in industry alone lost 90,000 jobs in the last five years. Today, however, it's readying for a resurgence. American chemistry employers provide approximately 780,000 direct jobs in the United States. They account for more than one-tenth of U.S. exports in their $674 billion industry. Using the typical 7-1 multiplier manufacturing uh, employers use, they support over 5 million jobs. The success of these domestic chemical employers is essential to our nation's economic recovery and in meeting the President's stated goal of doubling exports every five years. Therefore, any federal policy to keep our plants secure, families safe, and the public protected must also produce the regulatory certainty and stability needed so chemical employers can continue to safely grow and create jobs. Under the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards, or CFATS, more than 4,000 chemical plants and refineries and even hospitals and colleges have made significant improvements towards keeping our communities safe. In fact, since 9-11, the domestic chemical industry has spent an estimated $8 billion on plant security and under the existing framework will spend another $8 billion. A long-term authorization of CFATS will give the industry the certainty needed to make continual capital investments and continue growing and succeeding. Now, we can control chemical plant security for the United States plants, but note, we have no control over chemicals made outside the United States. So here in the U.S., the safety of these facilities is non-negotiable, and so is the ability of facility operators to keep their plants secure and manage their workforce. Plant operators need to be able to stay vigilant against all threats and respond quickly to information that would suggest a potential security risk. For example, 
CFAT's facilities rightly perform criminal and terroristic background checks on workers, but when that background check was completed 10 or 20 years ago, safety and security dictate that facilities perform an updated check. Plant operators must retain this ability to ensure their workers are who they say they are and their records indicating security risks are up to date. I urge my colleagues to oppose efforts that weaken the ability of plant operators to make personal decisions, personnel decisions about employees who could pose a potential risk. Plant owners are just as invested and committed as the into the safety of their plants as the community and the employees. We cannot allow a safety loophole that permits old, outdated security procedures on equipment or safety analysis that could weaken the protocols of the CFATs or ensure employers can perf can't perform background checks on workers. I'm hopeful that we can work through any issue my colleagues on the other side of the aisle may have with background checks and employee ID cards, and I thank my colleague Gene Green for working with me on this bill, as well as Chairman Shimkus and Chairman Upton, and hope that we can bring this measure to the full Energy and Commerce Committee for full consideration and passage. Let's pass this much needed legislation and ensure a key part of our homeland security policy is kept in place while also maintaining and growing jobs here at home. And I yield back. The chair recognizes for three minutes for his opening statement the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the hearing today, the markup we're going to be having tomorrow to deal with two important pieces of legislation. I want to start with H.R. 5, uh, and this is a bill brought by the uh, acting chair, and it's an important bill in addressing the problems that we're already seeing from Obamacare. And if you go back to this debate in, in two years ago when we really started this debate on health care reform, I think most of us were in agreement about what the problem was. And, and if you talk to families across this country, if you talk to small businesses across this country, uh, one of the biggest factors you hear in the problems they're experiencing with health care is the cost. Uh, because while some people might have access to health care, if the cost is too high and every year we continue to see it rise, uh, that becomes a big prohibitive factor uh, from people being able to get that access. And so cost should have been one of the driving factors as well as addressing the real problems in the health care system, uh, like addressing the problems uh, that, that there is currently discrimination against people with pre-existing conditions. That's a real problem that needs to be fixed. Now, we brought actual solutions to those problems during the debate last, uh, last Congress. Unfortunately, they decided to go with this government takeover of health care, this, this one-size-fits-all coming down from Washington with over 2,500 pages of legislation. And one thing it didn't address is cost, the biggest problem you hear uh, from people all across the country in the health care system. Their bill is actually scored to increase the cost of health care. That goes counter to what people wanted to be addressed in this bill. It's one of the reasons why the bill is so unpopular. It's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why the entire bill ought to be repealed and replaced with real reforms. Well, H.R. 5 is one of those important steps to really reforming the problems in health care. It goes directly at the problem of cost. Not one real item was mentioned in their bill in Obamacare to address these frivolous lawsuits that jack up the price of health care. By some estimates, $200 billion per year of health care dollars that families spend are not on treating the patient for health care. It's on doctors trying to prevent frivolous lawsuits by running all these defensive medicine tests. Every doctor will tell you what happens. And yet there wasn't a page in their bill that addressed that problem. $200 billion a year we can save families. You want to talk about jobs, as I talk to small business owners in my district, one of the things they'll tell you is one of the reasons they can't hire enough people is because of the high cost of health care. If we lowered the cost of health care by $200 billion per year, which this bill does, by doing real medical liability reform, you want to talk about a jobs bill. Not only have you solved a major problem in health care, you don't have senior citizens having to go and have all these tests run on them that they know and their doctor knows has nothing to do with improving their health. It's all about preventing the frivolous lawsuit. We address that problem in this bill. I think it's an important bill. Not only does it save families $200 billion a year, but it actually shaves over $60 billion off of our deficit over 10 years. So it's an important piece of legislation. I strongly support it. Also support H.R. 908, the CFATS extension, another important bill. And I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing and bringing these forward tomorrow. Yield back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands for three minutes for her opening statement, Dr. Christensen. Thank you, Dr. Henry. As a physician who has, in addition to practicing medicine for 20, over 21 years, 
has worked with defense attorneys and my fellow physicians on many malpractices, mal malpractice cases, it pains me to have to oppose H.R. 5, a bill that so many physician organizations support. But I do so chiefly because it harms the victims of injury, patients for whom I swore to do no harm, and because I find it potentially unfair to women, children, and the poor who often are minorities. And with malpractice contributing so little to health care spending, it does nothing to reduce national health care costs. This bill looks more like an attempt to settle a score with lawyers than one to fix a problem which experts put at the feet of insurers. Furthermore, in their zeal to attack the Affordable Care Act, the sponsors and the majority fail to recognize that bill's significant provisions that would reduce medical errors and increase patient safety, and the data that shows decreasing complaints and premiums where the practices included in that bill have already been in place. Physicians want to provide the best of care for their patients, and we help them to do that in the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> this bill, H.R. 5, which has not gone anywhere in the prior four times it's been introduced, does not, chiefly because it's based on false premises, sets limits that are unrealistic, does harm to an already harmed individual and does not go far enough in making them whole, can discriminate against women and the poor, and does nothing to rein in costs or increase patient safety. On H.R. 908, I am very pleased the committee is extending the authorization of the Chemical Facilities Anti-Terrorism Standards Act, as it's important to the security of our nation. That bill, however, falls far short of what's needed today. It fails to address a plethora of security, labor, and regulatory issues that must be adequately vetted before we move forward. It does not address existing security gaps. It does not address deficiencies in the authority of the Secretary of Homeland Security. It doesn't include reforms to ensure the involvement and protection of workers or allow for citizen enforcement. And it doesn't protect whistleblowers. It also doesn't encourage the sharing of information. That program is in need of a, an extension, but I will support the Democratic Amendment in the nature of a substitute at the appropriate time. Finally, let me say, <clears throat> say we've already wasted four months passing bills that are nothing more than anti-Obama rhetoric. H.R. 5 would be more of the same. Let's improve the standards for chemical facility security and spend our time better working to implement the Affordable Care Act in the best way possible working to slow climate change, to increase jobs, and to alleviate the many burdens the recession and high oil prices have put on the poor and the middle class in this country. Thank you. I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi for three minutes for his opening statement, uh, Mr. Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the so-called Affordable Care Act spends $1.445 trillion dollars reduces Medicare benefits $523 billion and raises taxes $569 billion, all the while failing to implement meaningful medical liability reform. In 2004, under the leadership of Governor Haley Barber, Mississippi enacted a comprehensive tort reform law that has significantly reshaped our medical liability system. As an example of how the environment has improved for health providers, one insurer who covers over 75% of the physicians in Mississippi has seen a cumulative 65.5% decrease in insurance premiums since 2005. Let me say that again. Over 75% of Mississippi doctors saw their insurance rates drop 65.5% in the past six years. Mississippi has been a model for tort reform, and I believe that Congress would benefit from emulating the strides made in my home state. I want to thank my friend and colleague from Georgia, Dr. Gingrey, for putting forward this common sense proposal that is designed to reduce the overall cost of health care by enacting true medical liability reform. Additionally, H.R. 908, which would extend the chemical facility anti-terrorism standards, is essential to ensuring that we are protected from terrorist attacks at the many chemical facilities located across the United States. I was happy to be present last week when such an important bill passed through subcommittee without objection, and I'm hopeful that it gains the same support at the full committee level. I ask that my colleagues join me in supporting H.R. 908. Thank you, and I yield the balance of my time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia for three minutes for his opening statement, Mr. McKinley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this markup on uh, H.R. 5 and H.R. 908. 
For more than 70 years now, West Virginia has been a premier destination for the world's leading chemical companies, employing nearly 10,000 West Virginians and contributing over $720 million a year in wages and salaries and more than $1 billion in federal and state revenues to the state's economy. I look forward to passing a clean version of H.R. 908 so that the men and women working in the chemical plants in my state will be protected from the vulnerabilities and potential acts of terrorism. As we mark up the Health, Care, Health Act, one of a series of job bills being promoted by the majority, we realize one of the glaring problems with Obamacare. It failed to deal with the country's broken medical liability system. The failure to fix liability has been further jeopardized patient access in this country as health care costs continue to skyrocket. The medical liability system continues to place tremendous financial burdens on doctors, patients, health care providers, and our federal government. West Virginia faced this problem head on in 2003. Because of the medical liability issues, doctors were fleeing the state or retiring early. Graduating medical students could not be recruited. And on average, hospitals were losing 5% of their medical staff. In addition, liability insurance costs doubled and even tripled in some cases. And some insurance providers even stopped covering some specialties. As a result, the state legislature passed legislation to reform the medical liability system. Among other provisions, the bill capped non-economic damages between $250,000 and $500,000. This and other reforms in the comprehensive bill ensure that patients had access to the care they need while still providing protection and a means of recourse for medical liability. Moreover, the bill made West Virginia a place where physicians wanted to practice again. Today, with different liability rules, doctors must practice defensive medicine to ensure they are not hit with frivolous lawsuits. In fact, more than 93% of doctors have admitted to practicing defensive medicine and reinforcing what Chairman Upton said earlier, it is estimated that defensive medicine costs our health system $210 billion a year. This is one aspect of rising health care costs that we can do something about, and I hope we can. H.R. 5 provides a sensible solution to the medical liability problem. This bill will help to restore our health care costs while still protecting patients. I look forward to seeing these bills pass this committee in the House and it's my hope that Senator Reid and President Obama will do the right thing and take action on both of them as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. The chair recognizes for three minutes opening statement uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. When Congress is considering health care reform, President Obama stressed that we must bend the cost curve essential to sustainability. Unfortunately, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act has failed to do so. The committee will be marking up H.R. 5, a bill that will help relieve a significant portion of health care costs by fixing a broken medical liability system. Excessive costs incurred by practicing defensive medicine are affecting all Americans and costing the federal government billions of dollars in health expenditures. In fact, according to a Price Waterhouse Coopers study, in 2008, the practice of defensive medicine resulted in $210 billion in additional health care costs. The medical liability system in place today has hurt patient access. Increasing costs in medical liability coverage has led to fewer surgeons and high-risk specialists. As a result, patients are forced to travel uh, greater distances for key medical services, creating significant hardships for them and for their families. In New Jersey, where I live, which has precious little medical liability reform, general surgeons experience medical liability insurance premiums that are nearly double those of general surgeons in California, whose landmark law is the basis for H.R. 5. Congressional Budget Office has estimated that H.R. 5 could reduce the deficit by as much as $62 billion over 10 years. H.R. 5 is an important step in bending back the health care cost curve while ensuring patients retain access to critical care 
and are able to recover all of their economic losses as a result of negligent care. In January, President Obama listed fundamental medical liability reform as a necessary step in addressing rising health care costs. I urge all of our colleagues to report favorably this bill so that we can start down the path of achieving that goal. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas for three minutes for an opening statement, Mr. Olson. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership in bringing forward H.R. 5, Comprehensive Medical Liability Reform Legislation. As my colleagues have mentioned, our nation's medical liability system is broken. It's hurt patient access to care and has inflicted tremendous costs on our nation. In fact, defensive medicine is estimated to cost our nation up to $210 billion per year. But there is good news. My home state of Texas has been at the forefront of medical liability reform. Between 2000 and 2009, the Texas Medical Board saw an increase of roughly 60%, 60% in their new physician licensure applications. Since 2003, when medical liability reform was enacted, Texas had 21,640 new physicians licensed in our state. That means more doctors to treat patients, especially in rural areas with limited access to health care. All major physician liability carriers in Texas have cut their rates, resulting in nearly all Texas physicians having their premiums lowered by at least 30% some well over 40 percent since 2004. In my meetings with doctors at the Texas Medical Center, I have heard countless stories about the benefits doctors have seen in Texas from tort reform. One facility in the district I represent is in Sugarland, Texas, the Kelsey Siebold Clinic. They wrote to me sharing their story with Texas tort reform as a major step forward in the ability to address the value of health care. I'm going to read from that letter right now. I quote, in 2003, the Texas professional liability crisis was peaking. Kelsey Siebel was a favorite target of lawsuits because of the size of our group. We could not obtain professional liability insurance that year at any price. We were forced to create a self-insurance program for this risk. Kelsey Siebel was spending an average of $6 million a year per year in professional liability costs. After tort reform, their professional liability costs fell to one million per year. With that $5 million savings they, they generated, they invested it in the installation of a comprehensive electronic medical record system. This investment has allowed them to, and I quote again, coordinate our care more effectively so that we can solve our patients' problems more efficiently with measurably better outcomes, end quote. My colleagues, this is just one example of the thousands of success stories coming out of Texas tort reform. Adopting comprehensive medical liability reform on a nationwide basis through Dr. Gingrey's bill, H.R. 5, will help improve the cost and quality of American health care and will save our nation billions in defensive medicine costs. I urge swift, ado swift adoption of this legislation and thank the Chairman and Mr. Gingrey for their leadership. I yield back my time. The Chair calls up H.R. 5 and asks the Clerk to report. H.R. 5, to improve patient access to health care services and provide improved medical care by reducing the excessive burden the liability system places on the health care delivery system. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered. For the information of members, we are now on H.R. 5. We will recess the committee and reconvene at 10.30 a.m. tomorrow. And I remind members that the chair will give priority recognition to amendments offered on a bipartisan basis. I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. The committee is now recessed.